Uh, my name is Veronica Santiago Lu, and I welcome you to this space. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that it's not, we've been calling this a new space, or our, our new space, uh, but it's not new and it's not really ours. Because um, we want to acknowledge first that uh, we are on the homeland of the Lenape Hoking, who were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. The Lenape are a diasporic people that remain closely connected with this land are, and um, are its rightful stewards. This place, um, yeah, this place. Uh, before I even describe what this place is, I, I wanted to find out who has, who, who knows Word Up, who's been to Word Up before with a show of hands. Wow, a good number of you, okay. Um, welcome back. If you've been to Word Up, and welcome if, you're, if you haven't been to Word Up at the before. Word Up is, uh, the main space is located Amsterdam and 165th Street, so not too far from here. And it's a community-made uh, bookstore and art space. It's collectively run. We were meant to just be a one-month-long pop-up shop 11 years ago, but that one month clearly wasn't going to be enough. Um, with a lot of community support and a volunteer collective that grew and grew, uh, we've been, we've now been, we, we moved to our new space, newer, newer space that's now almost nine years old, and have been doing um, events, youth programming, uh, even COVID testing, you know, whatever it is, you name it. Whether it's you know both trying to get books out to our community members. Um, and also all the other resources that you need to be able to absorb the books. Um, that's, that's what our mission is, really, to just support the community in whatever ways we can uh, with members of the community um, accompanying us and as part of us. Um, this space uh, came about because one of those collective members uh, who was integral to the starting of Word Up and who was there for our first half uh, in our existence, passed away from COVID in June 2020. And right before he went on a ventilator, he called and let me know how to get into his apartment and how to access his four storage units full of books and records, floor to ceiling. And so after that, after he did pass uh, June 3rd, 2020, um, his old friends, his Word Up collective member friends, uh, packed up his apartment and moved it all, this, all to this space, which has been empty for at least 40 years, um, and to try and recirculate those items and to make it another community space, a community-made space that, um, in, in whatever way we can. Um, so that's that's how this place came about. Uh, we are working on a lease right now, so hopefully can stay here a little longer. Um, and we invite you to let us know what you need out of this place, out of our original space, out of anything we can do, and um, also to support it in whatever way you can. Word Up is a nonprofit, uh, so whatever pay what you wish books that you uh, you know get are all that money will help uh, support Word Up's programming and being able to stay in place and support the community. Um, I also want to. Uh, give a special acknowledgement to, as I introduce her, um, Angie Cruz, who will introduce the rest of the panel, the uh, rest of the readers and authors who are so, so honored uh, to have here. It really, it really is an honor to have this like rock star lineup. Um, and most of all, to have it, you know, this, this event be really led by Angie. This event uh, is the fourth of El Gran Combo that we've hosted. And the first came about as one of the, I think, our first really complicated Zoom event right after lockdown. Um, and it, it turned out to be one of the best events we've ever had in all of our 11 years. Um, and we've had a series of them ever since, all virtual. This is the first time it's live. Um, yeah. <laughs> But Angie has also been uh, just a very special um, friend to Word Up, to me, to this, to this space. Some of the features that you will see in this space that seem like they're just part of the space really came about because of uh, some, some magic that Angie uh, put together, like the beautiful mural behind the authors, even the lighting, even just the, the little things that you can't see, like how it's a little bit safer in these ways that you, don't <laughs> you can't tell because of a team of people that helped sort of make that happen in this space. It was because of Angie, um, who's an amazing author, and uh, I think that 
And, and Ao is a Word Up board member and has just been so supportive in so many ways. Um, so thank you for, for making this event happen and for, for everyone for being here. And also thank you to all the Word Up staff and volunteers who are also here too, who've been helping make this event happen. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here in person. Um, when we, um, at the start of the pandemic, um, it was very, very dark times and we were sheltering in place and Jaquira Diaz and Carolina de Robertis, um, two Latinx writers and I were like, oh my God, there's all these new books by Latinx writers and they're going to disappear in the pandemic because there was so little visibility and the bookstores were shutting down and their future was really bleak. And we thought, what can we do as Latinx writers to uplift and amplify the work of Latina writers and also bookstores? Because what are we without our bookstores in our communities? And during pandemic, Word Up really did a lot for this community. Everything from food relief to COVID testing um, and still trying to get books online to people. And um, so we thought, okay, let's do a Gran Combo online, hoping that someone would come virtually to see us talk about literature and the exciting things that we're doing in our work. Um, and yes, um, I went to Veronica, and Veronica, um, with the help of Emmanuel and Carolina and the staff of Word Up, somehow we figured out how to launch El Gran Combo online with two other bookstores and together, we actually had probably one of the most successful literary events in that moment where people still hadn't figured it out. Veronica figured it out. Yeah. Um, so I see Veronica, Lou, and Word Up and the work as innovators in this field and teaching publishing what can happen through grassroots um, movements um, and work. So thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Carolina, for just being amazing and open to all my ideas. I have a lot of ideas, and most people just don't listen, but like Veronica's like, okay, <laughs> let's make that happen. <laughs> so thank you um, for entertaining um, our vision, and thank you to all of you for being here, coming from all over the country, it's so exciting, and the city, and all of you that I know that have traveled to be here today, um, it means a lot to be in person. But there's also all these people streaming virtually um, because there you go, hi, uh, <laughs> because um, we started virtually, right, when we were sheltering in place. So it just feels really, really, really exciting to be here. Um, on the stage, we have, as you know, some of the most exciting living writers today, and today we are celebrating their new books. And, um, and literally, these books are touching like every corner of the United States and their histories. So. Um, you can find like their regular bio online um, very easily. I just wanted to give a little bit about the books because we're here. This is a place where we sell books. You all bought books to be here. And I just thought for those of you who don't know these writers, I just wanted to give you a taste of each of um, the books being presented here. Um, so the first book is A Woman of Endurance um, <laughs> by Dalma Llanos Figueroa. And she's the author of this novel that illuminates a little discussed aspect of history, the Puerto Rican Atlantic slave trade. Like you're literally the first to write this story. Um, witnessed through the experiences of Pola, an, an African captive used as a breeder to bear more slaves. Um, beautifully written, I highly recommend it. I hope all of you just get it. Um, Next, we have Neruda. It's very awkward because I'm doing a million things at time. So sorry. I'm usually not this awkward, but okay. Very, very elegant person. Neruda <laughs> of the Park by Clevis Latera. Um, welcome back, Clevis. You were here a few weeks ago. Um, she's the author of this book that is set predominantly um, near here, let's say, <laughs> um, Dominican part of New York City weaving a rich and vivid tapestry of community as well as the sacrifices we make to protect what we love most. I definitely think that she surprised us with this ending. All of you, you have to read the book to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful storytelling, highly recommended. Reina, um, Reina Grande 
It is really a treat. Um, the author of A Ballad of Love and Glory. I mean, I've been reading Reina for a very long time and so excited to finally be in space with you. Um, Reina Grande is the is um, wrote about a forgotten war, an unforgettable romance set in the year of 1846. Yo, like, th I'm telling you, covering lots of history here. Uh, <laughs> after the controversial annexation of Texas, where the US Army marches south to provoke war with Mexico over the disputed Rio Grande boundary. Um, and finally, um, we have the debut novel of Cali Far Fajardo Einstein, Woman of Light. Um, <laughs> Again, very happy to have you in New York. Um, it's really a treat. I mean, I think sometimes people don't remember, I mean, don't know how hard it is to bring all these Latinx writers in the same room at the same time. They usually separate us, and we're like a token in one panel in one conference. But we're all here together among community, and it's kind of amazing. So, Woman of Light, set in 1930s. You see, it's like traveling in time. <laughs> if you're bored with this moment or you're sick of it, go to the 1930s <laughs> in Denver, Colorado, and read this book about survival and family secrets that span five generations of an indigenous Chicano family in, in the American West. So here we are, our beautiful panel here. Um, let's just give them a round of applause, because we're celebrating. <laughs> So um, I'm really excited about this conversation. And I thought that we should start by getting a sense of their voices and their work. Um, and each of you, if you wouldn't mind reading a scene from your book, and tell us a little bit about what inspired the scene or, or something you learned from the scene. Um, and then we'll just you know, start talking from there. Um, do you want to start, Thelma? Sure. Okay, sure. great. Uh, Woman of Endurance is the second in a series of books. The first book was Daughters of the Stone. And one of the really hard things about writing a series of books is how do you tell the second, third, and fourth story without going back mm. to the first story uh, mm. and repeating what you've already said? That isn't working. Can you hear? Yeah, this yeah, is d much better. So how do you continue this story without repetition? And how do you write it so that someone who picks up book three will understand what's going on even if they didn't read book one and two? So um, what I'm going to read today is um, a little part. <clears throat> the book takes place primarily in Puerto Rico but this little part takes place in Yoruba land, and it, it takes place um, uh, about 10 or 15 years before the action of this book, okay? Um, oh, you know what, I'm sorry. I switched um, <laughs> uh, excerpts. So th this is a story of Pola. And this is a, a story of when Fola arrives at a plantation after she had been caught and beaten to a pulp, she wakes up in this new place and doesn't know what's going on. The woman who's taking care of her is a curandera, someone who heals with herbs. And so the two people involved here are Pola and the curandera whose name is Rufina. They done a lot of harm down there. Rufina wipes her eyes with a corner of the apron. Don't know how many of them or for how long, but I imagine you've been through a particular kind of hell. Hijo de su puta madre. She spit out the last words. Silence. Pola doesn't want those pictures in her head again. Most times, we can't change what's done to us, but we can fight. I know you. I know you know a little something about that, the not giving up part. I know you're a fighter, because you're still here. Mija, I mend your body, but the soul, that takes more time, and it's up to you. Still, Pola doesn't want to move. Until this very moment, she has forgotten herself, thoughts of the future, 
and now here. She has forbidden herself thoughts of the future, and now here, this woman is opening a whole new world of wounds that Paula has never really considered. Her thoughts drift to the visions of a life in which there will never be the sound of her own child laughing, or small arms reaching out to her, or the word mama called in the night. She realizes that she has been so focused on the losses of the past that she really has embraced herself for those of the future. How could she? They took her body long ago. They took her babies. She realizes now that somewhere hidden deep inside, in some impenetrable place, she sheltered the hope that somehow, maybe, someday, maybe, but no more, they took that too. She did not even get to make the acquaintance of that possibility before it too was taken away. Paula wants the darkness to swallow her again, the blessed not knowing. This is what she wants, but the darkness doesn't come at her bidding. She sits and faces the reality of the emptiness that will forever inhabit her womb. Rufina looks down at Paula, whose body has gone limp, as though every muscle has lost definition, and all that is left is a poor substitute for the woman who blindly defended herself against Simon. All the fight has emptied out of her. La curandera has seen this before, bodies she has mended, walking around empty and soulless. Too often the emptiness won and the body just withered away. But this woman has too much left, life left for that, and Rufina has worked too hard to save her. No matter how dark the night, the sun always comes from behind the clouds on the other side of midnight. But Rufina's words sound hollow even to her own ears. La curandera can see her patient slipping away from her, the pain of the beating, but the pain of survival. Even as she watches Paula's spirit wilting, Rufina refuses to give up on the woman with the teeth that cut and the looks that wound. She has gotten a glimpse of the fighting spirit of Paula, and she must conjure it back. What? After all you've been through, you're going to give up? You're going to let those white bastards win? Paula sits very still. She isn't reacting but at least she isn't retreating either. Those animales, those barbaros, you going to give up your life to them just like that after all these years? You're worth so little that you won't even put up a fight for your own life? Very slowly, Paula raises her gaze and Rufina jumps at the chance. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they already took everything and have left nothing for you to fight for. Guess I'd not read you good at all. Thought you were still worth a little something, but maybe you already dead and you don't even know it. The tiny muscles on the outer corner of Paula's eyes twitch and her panting begins, nostrils flaring at the effort to control her breathing. Her body hasn't moved as much as inflated with growing outrage. Rufina catches a transition from despondency to f defiance to anger to rage. Well then, she grabs Paula's shoulders. Then you got some fight left in you after all. You need me right now. It'll be a while before you do battle on your own. I help you all I can and there's others here who will help too, but this is your fight and you have to win it. To do that, you have to get well. You got a name? Yes, perfect. All right, let's, let's keep it going. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's so good to see all you beautiful people showing arms and legs. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read to you a little bit from Chapter 4. Um, this book is really concerned with gentrification and what happens. 
It's on, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, I, you can tell I don't need it, right? <laughs> so the book is really concerned with gentrification and the displacement of our communities. And so, you know, one of the things that I was very chicken shit, and pardon my French for the children, but I was very nervous and scared about writing the scene because I was like, how is it possible that someone would convince someone else? to what my main character convinces people to do. So this is, <laughs> this is my attempt. Um, and this was one of the, I would say, one of the most difficult scenes that I wrote. Eusebia willed herself to stop the sensation of movement, of falling and twirling through the air in opposite directions at once, a, na a nauseous feeling. Usually, this was the moment that forced her to close her eyes and seek lower ground. Not today. On weak knees, she walked to where the women stood and inhaled deeply as she leaned over. Beneath them, on top of this building, it was as if a bomb had exploded. Bricks and pipes, concrete, refrigerators, stoves, even farther away, discarded toys, a doll with matted blonde hair, a blue truck missing a wheel. She was puzzled at the sharpness of her vision. How could they have done all of that in three days? How could they possibly have gotten that done so fast? Fast, one of the women asked. They discarded the old building to make room for what? Her friends, the tongues, asked. Eusebia never imagined there would be this much space. I have an idea on how to stop all of this from happening, she said. The tongues looked at her curiously. What if we just scare everyone into thinking this neighborhood is really bad, she said. The women smiled, thinking at a joke, brilliant in its simplicity. How would we do that, they asked. Eusebia could clearly see the unvoiced thought that it would be too easy to work. Eusebia then spoke in a confident way, as if this conversation had already happened. She explained she meant recruiting their neighbors, who would act out crimes throughout the neighborhood with other volunteers who'd be victims of these crimes. You mean fake crimes, they asked. No, not fake, real. Who'd be crazy enough to move to a neighborhood amid a crime spree? What kind of crimes, they asked. <laughs> Eusebia was quiet. She had come up with a list, but she knew if they participated, helped formulate it, they'd be in. What would scare you, she asked. What would be bad enough? This is the kind of idea that can destroy a community, the women said. That can save it, she corrected. The women stared at her, worried. They understood she was serious. She had moved too fast. Eusebia extended her arm around the neighborhood, lovingly sweeping all they could see. Over by their side of the park, Raul's shipping place, the cleaners owned by the chinitos who were born in the yard, the liquor store, the dentist. She wrapped her arm around herself, signaling what they couldn't see. The smell of water boiling for root vegetables, of meat sizzling in pans, laundry being folded, children being kissed, phone calls back home to people who needed help, who would be lost without the support of those who had traveled here. We can just come up with a list of things people are scared of, she said. The women exchanged looks. They spoke to each other with the simple speed of a blink. But now Eusebia was in on it, an eavesdropper. Questions floated among all four of them. Could it work? Was it worth trying? What else as an alternative? It was true, fear would work. Fear always worked. She turned her body away from then, away from the park, her phone vibrated in her pocket. Her daughter Luz or her husband Vladimir must be worried, but she'd care for them later. Now she turned her attention to the destruction beneath them. It talked at something in the women, but Eusebia was the only one who had called out the dead boy's name. She had a strange feeling of being anchored to the tarmac on the roof of that building. It made sense when the blinding sky turned black and the sun was replaced by a yellow pockmarked moon. There was complete stillness and silence in the worksite. The men had gone home. If we don't stop it, Eusebia said, it will not be stopped. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that, Clavis. It was so beautiful, and I guess I should speak up as loud as you do. It's so, it's so commanding. Um, so the scene I'm going to read to you takes place towards the end of the novel. And I'm not going to ruin the ending for you because you all know the ending. You know Mexico lost <laughs> half of its territory. <laughs> so um, in this scene, 
the scene is between Santa Ana, who has the gun down in history as the man who sold out his country, and my protagonist, Jimena, who was forced to be his personal nurse throughout the war. He came to her that evening, disguised as a street peddler, rain dripping from his sarape. He walked into the little house she'd moved into when she could no longer bear to be in the barracks without John. He hung his sarape on a hook by the door and then looked at her. His hair was disheveled, his face haggard. She had been praying at her altar, and before she got off her knees to see what he wanted, he stopped her. No se levante, he said. He limped to her side and removed his wooden leg, using it for support as he bent down to pray with her. He groaned at the pain, but knelt on the floor alongside her, lowering his head as his voice joined hers in prayer. When their throats eventually grew hoarse and dry, she helped him get up. He sat on the chair while she tended to his leg. It was inflamed and the wound had opened again. She washed it clean. He sighed in relief as she applied her Arnica Mexicana salve, massaging it into his skin. Why have you come? She asked him as she finished dressing his wound. To take you with me, he said. I depart at midnight. My council of war has decided to vacate the city. I'm withdrawing my troops to Guadalupe Hidalgo. You're abandoning us? You're allowing the Yankees to take possession of the capital? For now, until I, until I replenish my troops, until I figure out a new strategy to restore our country's liberty and honor. You've lost. There's no strategy that will change that. You have been defeated. He hung his head and fixed his gaze upon the floor, and then very quietly at first, he began to cry. As his sobs grew louder, she looked away, not wanting to witness the president of the Republica Mexicana bawling like a spring calf separated from its mother. She wouldn't comfort him nor join her sorrow to his. Instead, she grabbed the bottle of mezcal she used for healing and poured him and herself a shot. Was it true? She asked him as she handed the drink to him. He took the mezcal and downed it, then held out the earthen cup for another. When he asked for a third shot, she refused. He looked at her and nodded, finally admitting what she had always known in her heart. All this time, the rumors were true? She served herself another shot and sat down. He took out a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his eyes dry. While I was in Cuba, living in exile, I dispatched my friend, Colonel Alejandro Atocha, to pay President Polk the visit and bargain with him on my behalf, he said. In exchange for $30 million, Santa Ana had promised to give Polk the territory he wanted, but he insisted that Polk attack Mexico first so that it looked as if it was by force. It was crucial for the Mexican people to believe that their government had no other choice but to negotiate with the Yankees. I was the one who told Polk how to attack us, he said. I told him that the Mexican people would never yield unless forced to do so. I provided him with a plan of attack to send his forces to our northern frontier, to send a naval expedition to Veracruz and take advantage of our scarcity of ships to guard the coast. I promised him that if he helped me return from exile and establish myself firmly in power, I would convince our government to make peace with the United States and give him what he asked for, the Rio Bravo boundary, Alta California, Nuevo Mexico. This was your plan all along then, to sell us out? You were defeated on purpose? You sacrificed John and the San Patricios? No! He grabbed her hands, and when she tried to pull them away, he squeezed them harder, pleading. Listen to me, Jimena. I lied to the Yankee president. I never intended to despoil our country. I just wanted him to help me return from exile. My country needed me to save them, to have faith in me again. You understand? 
The minute I returned, I placed myself at the head of our army and spent every waking breath trying to restore Mexico's honor. I betrayed my agreement with Polk. Don't you see? He said, kissing her hands. He laughed smugly and said, I fooled him. That land-grabbing Yankee believed me and restored me to power, whereupon I dedicated myself to make him understand that I would never consent to despoil Mexico of her northern territories. Jimena, querida, trust me when I say that I didn't take my troops, I didn't take Riley and his men into the battlefield to lose. I meant to win. I meant to bring victory to Mexico. I meant to give us all a little taste of glory. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Kali Fajardo Anstein and I'm going to read from my debut novel, Woman of Light. I actually come from the northern frontier of Mexico. I am, um, I'm a Chicana of mixed indigenous Filipino and European ancestry, and I um, invented a place called the Lost Territory that is in this novel to understand my history and my upbringing where I come from. So the scene I'm going to read, this whole book is based on my own family history, the oral stories that were told to me by my elders. And I'm going to read a scene that's that focuses on the character Luce. She's our protagonist. She's a woman of light. She's clairvoyant. She's psychic. And we're going to follow her as she first comes to Denver from Southern Colorado. And in this scene, um, something is going to happen that is, it's, well, you'll listen. OK. <laughs> Shelter from the storm. Seems strange, don't you think? David said to Luce as he opened the office door to the street. It was the late afternoon and the end of April. Luce was almost done with her shift at the law office. Sunlight moved around David's shoulders and curly hair and pressed into the lobby. The thunder? Luce asked. No, said David. It's too consistent. And he stepped outside onto the sidewalk. Luce stood from her desk and followed him into the warmish spring air. What do you mean, she called. The sounds grew into a roaring pitch, a mass of jeers, their source concealed by the great gray city. The air turned. The sky was laced with stinging cold, and several passers-by had almost noticed the unusual sounds, and they too slowed to a stroll, their faces turned upward to the rumbling. Luce stayed on the sidewalk and watched as David walked through the eerily trafficless street down the thin medium, surrounded by parked automobiles and dated brown carriages. He looked upon the horizon where the site of the road ended in the train station, nestled between brick offices and the backdrop of the mountains. Luce watched as David walked in his black suit. He moved gradually, but as the sounds grew, he sprinted until he reached Luce, until he reached what Luce suspected was a higher vantage point the place where he could see the source of all the commotion. At once, David turned and with both arms waving, yelled for Luce to go inside. Now he hollered, sprinting back in her direction. Right now, inside! Hairs rose along her neck. A darkness swirled overhead, dizzyingly strange, as if the city was about to be engulfed by a tornado. Now, Luce! David ran to catch up to her on the sidewalk. As David rushed toward her, Luce searched over his shoulders and scanned the long road once more at the blurred edge of 17th Street in the space reserved for Sky, Luce saw the unrelenting beginnings of a long white parade. Men and women cloaked in white robes, their pointed hoods bobbing along the horizon, an American flag displayed among the first row, a pine cross held into the air, Luce had not seen a KKK march with such numbers since her childhood. And the longer she stared, the more the parade revealed itself like a flopping white serpent emerging from the ground, a hateful, moving body. In those fleeting moments as she stood on the sidewalk before David yanked her by the left wrist and guided them both inside the office, Luce stared at hundreds of Klan members. There was a section of women 
their white rosy faces in the chilly afternoon, their small children, some no more than three or four years old, pulled along in red wagons. How, loose thought, could they bring their babies? Wow. Um, oh my God. You know, one of the things I was thinking about all your books, they're all so ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the ways that you're trying to like hold all these characters, tell these big stories. And I know for a fact that all of you actually have faced many challenges in trying to tell the stories that you're trying to tell. And also, a number of you spent many years to write these books. Why are you looking and, at me, though? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not just you. It takes me forever. And the reason I bring it up is because I think a lot of people that are watching us or listening are writers, right? And they see the book and they're like, oh, look. A book it happened so fast and look you know it's so exciting um, but the reality is that it takes a lot to get this book from an idea to what we see here and I'm curious being that you know this has been a long passage for a lot of these books like do you, any of you want to share like your knit like if there was some kind like I find that when I start a book the book I eventually end up writing is very different and I'm curious now that we have the end product, like where did you start and where did you end up and what did you learn from that process as writers? Mm. Clavis, stop looking at me so <laughs> intentionally. And because we're among family, I can talk to Clavis like this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but oh, go ahead, Clavis. Why don't you share? Oh, because I, I know that know. you've had, um, you have a lot to say yeah. about this. I love talking about this because it has a happy ending. <laughs> It's like we ended up with a book. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, for me, I had a, a pretty difficult time because I started writing this book at the heels of another failed project. I had, you know, my thesis MFA, which I, we got very close to selling it, but the whole deal fell apart. And then as I was trying to distract myself from that heartache, I started writing this book. And little did I know it would be 15 years before this book would be published, right? So um, when you ask about how did the book change, I love to think about how, you know, when I started writing this book, I was 29 years old, and I remember like the book was very much about like this very attractive and beautiful 29-year-old woman <laughs> who's like coming home and finds that the whole neighborhood is under threat, and it was like a first-person narrative, and it was like a coming-of-age story, you know, about this young woman. And what kept happening is that her mother was running around creating havoc. And the story didn't work because I wouldn't let the mother have a point of view. And you know, like during the course of the book, I became a mother. And so I remember like after having my children being like, of course the mother needs her own point of view, duh, you know? <laughs> and, but it would still be some time before, you know, I was able to make the story work. Because like I said, when I was reading my excerpt, like part of what was really hard about this book is that the book is dealing with displacement, but it's also dealing with a great deal of pain. And I wanted to write the story in a way that was funny and sexy. And so there were like, uh, like you're saying, like an ambition within the book to talk about really difficult things, but to do it in a way where it would still be an enjoyable, can't put down book. And so for me, like once I eventually got to the point where I figure out how to do it, it just filled me with so much pride, you know? Because telling our stories is hard enough and I didn't want trauma porn, you know? Like I didn't want to write a story that was only focused on the pain of being displaced, but really on like the rage and the fight that lives within our communities. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, Dalma, you too, right? Like you spent a long time working on this book and must have done so much research for this. Yes, I did. Um, I thought, as I said, this is the second book. I took a character who was a minor character in the first book, and, but she had a very dominant personality. She was very angry. She was very combative. She was very, um, she's just full of rage. And I decided this is the kind of character who could lead a slave rebellion. And I wanted to write that. And I started writing the outline for that. I taught English for 30 years. And I taught kids, you write an outline so you know where you're going. And you make a map and you follow it. When I started writing, I realized all of that had to go out the window because 
that's not the way I write. The way I write is I get up in the morning, four or five is a good time, and I meditate and I talk to my characters mm. in my meditation. And when I talk to this character, she said, that's the story you want, that's not my story. <laughs> no, no, my story is I was repeatedly raped, my children were taken away and sold on the slave market. And that story, even though people know that there was breeding of slaves everywhere, it has never been told from my point of view. So that's what you need to write, my story, not the one you made up. And I have learned, the older I get, that there is a voice living in me, and maybe in all of us, that is the creative force in us. And it knows better than what you think should happen. And so I've learned to listen. My husband says, oh, she listens to the voices in her head. And he's, la he's, he's teasing me about that, but in a sense it's true. I get these images when I meditate, and then it's up to me to put it into language so that I can share it with you. Once I gave up trying to force my characters to be what I wanted them to be, and I accepted them who for whom they were, then the writing wasn't so hard. The hard part is getting your ego out of the way and saying, you know what? That story is more important than anything you can make up because as a human being, I'm limited. I can only do but so much. But your creative force, whether you're a Jungian and you call it collective cultural memory, whether you are a Roman Catholic and you call it uh, your guardian angels, whether you're an espiritista and you call it a, uh, you know, a, a, a protective spirit, whatever it is you believe in. Los Santos, there you go, right? If you're, if you're a Santero, you believe in your Orisha, right? Whatever it is, that guides you in directions that you cannot predict. And I've learned, follow the, follow the creative force. You know, get your ego out of the way. Cal yeah. Kali, it seems like this really resonated with you. Like, what is your experience? Um, I had a, a similar experience of just following the creative force, but the reason why Woman of Light took over a decade, not because I can't write fast. I have friends that are like, oh, you can write a short story really quickly and blah, 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 but it's actually because I didn't have money and I didn't have time and I was working all kinds of jobs and publishers wouldn't publish me and magazines wouldn't publish me and everybody was saying no, 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 no. So the reason why this took over a decade is because I didn't have a yes. And when I finally did get that yes, I worked my butt off and I wrote and I rewrote. I actually started Woman of Light before Sabrina and Karina. Wow. And I knew that this would be my life's work. I wanted to tell the story of my ancestors. People like my family had never been in literature before, only in a small way and in a way that didn't ex exactly define who we were in Colorado. So this book, it really, it came out of a lot of struggle, a lot of no's, a lot of this mountainous girl having to live by the ocean, having to live in crowded cities in the south, having to live in places that were not where I'm from, and listening to sirens and gunshots <laughs> outside my window. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I actually remember I was doing a Zoom call. I was finishing up Women of Light, and the Denver Police Department, they were practicing um, some sort of new technology they had where they were just blasting gunshots into the night. Mm. And I, it, was, it was to scare us. It was to make us afraid and to make us stop protesting. It was the summer of 2020. And a lot of this book has to do with racism and the ways that we've been oppressed over and over. And I remember telling that Zoom call, I'm really sorry that the police department is just shooting guns over and over again. <laughs> uh, but this is in my book, too. And yeah, it took a long time, but it took a long time because of the conditions and because of the publishing industry, not because I'm a really, really slow writer. Um, and I hope I, I get quicker next time. Yeah. So. <laughs> Rina, do you want to respond? Uh, yeah, so this book took me about seven years on and off. 
But I did publish two books in between those seven years. So I, I was writing, but I kept putting this book away because I kept being afraid that I didn't have it in me to write this book. It, I kept telling myself I had taken on more than I could do, more than I could handle. And so I would return to my comfort zone, which is memoir. So then I would put it away, go back to memoir, and then come back to it, write a few scenes uh, here and there, and then leave again. And it just overwhelmed me because, you know, I was writing about the U.S. invasion of Mexico in the 1840s. I knew nothing about it. I did, like most of you, probably never heard of the Mexican-American War in school. I didn't learn about it through my K through 12 um, classes. It wasn't until I took a history of Mexico class as an undergrad, which I thought was hilarious. I said, this is the war that doubled the US in size, <laughs> and we never learn about it in US history, and yet I had to take a history of Mexico class <laughs> to learn about it. But you know, the Mexicans have never gotten over it. And, um, and it's a shame, right, that here it has been forgotten. So I, I challenged myself to write this book because I wanted to learn the history that I wasn't taught. And I thought, if I write a book about it, that's how I'm gonna teach myself. And I, I did, I read over 100 history books. I, I read a lot of articles, a lot of uh, primary sources like diaries, letters, so I learned everything I could, and the transformation that I experienced was that this book empowered me, because in learning my history and teaching myself this history, I started to reframe the way I see myself as a Mexican immigrant living in this country. Because growing up in California, all my life I've been told that I'm an outsider, that I'm a foreigner, that I'm a trespasser, that I have no right to be here, I have been made to feel ashamed of my Mexican roots, of my Spanish uh, language. And yet, once I, once I learn about this war and how the place where I call home, California, used to be part of Mexico, I realized that in erasing this moment in history, the United States has recast the Mexican people as uh, invaders. Right, And if you go to the U.S. border, you see billboards that say stop the border invasion. And the question is, well, who are the invaders? And now I know that that's not me. I'm not the outsider here. That's, that's incredibly uh, moving. And I feel like we hold a lot of things in common and thinking about that all our stories are trying to represent a history or a story that has not been told and that we think it's important that it's told. And actually, I, you know, one of the fun things of El Gran Combo, and this is part of the tradition of Gran Combo, is that usually the audience is full of stars too. And um, I wanted to do a shout out because like you, Reina, I didn't learn about, like say, the history of Malcolm X until I went to college. And I grew up right across the street from the Audubon Ballroom and I went to school till eighth grade, a block away from the Audubon Ballroom, and no one ever talked about the history of that building. So in some ways I said, wait, I grew up across that building, I didn't know Malcolm X died there, I didn't know he met there, um, he was assassinated there, but I wrote about this in Dominicana, and I wanna shout out Kiani Antiguas in the audience, <laughs> who is a translator and, you know, and quite significant too, and this was through the help of Veronica Liu and Seven Stories Press. Um, she happens to be the first Dominican translator to translate a Dominican book, which is kind of amazing. Um, and this is also one of the big problems in the publishing industry where we're trying to tell stories and sometimes, you know, they're misrepresented or, you know, we need to fight for this. That's what I'm saying. So um, thank you, Kiani, for being here. and. Um, and also, I wanted to shout out, because we have more stars in the room, um, Christine Candic torres book, The Girls and Queens, is here. Yes. And I have to say, this book is not even out yet. It comes out tomorrow, and we are illegally selling the book today. So if you want the book, don't tell, oh my god, this is streaming. Take it back, take it back. Rewind, rewind. You can't rewind. 
buy it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, but we're, she's here. And what, um, as we're asking questions, um, I, I invite also you both, if you want to participate in this conversation, because you also are part of this conversation. And if the stage was bigger, I would tell you to come on. But yeah. okay. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, you know, part of, like El Gran Combo was really about like invisibility, right? Like we'll, what will happen to these bookstores? Who will take care of these bookstores? What will happen to these Latinx books if they don't reach their audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but another thing, so in some ways the pandemic gift was bringing this whole thing together, right? Like maybe without pandemic, I wouldn't have gotten so involved in Word Up or become so, um, concerned about the life of this bookstore or the small bookstores in the community, but also connect virtually with so many writers because we're so far away from each other. Like I don't go to California. I go once every two years, right? Or Colorado. <laughs> Holly, how would I found you? So, <laughs> so I'm curious, like for your writing, for your life, for the ways that you think about community, what are some of the pandemic gifts that you've experienced? Do you, any of you have any ways that things you want to hold on to that you learned through the pandemic or not or like things that were quite difficult because I know that there's both I, for me it was um, it was the gift of silence and of stillness since I couldn't go anywhere the only place I could go was within mm. and when you go within you find jewels that you don't have time for when you're running around making a living. Um, that's not to, to diminish all the losses we have had because God knows we've lost a lot. Um, but we also need to be grateful that we are still here and our children are here and what are we passing on to them. So my stillness and my quiet was a lot about embracing elderhood and realizing that before I leave this earth, I need to leave something for the people who come behind me. And I don't think that would have happened quite that way had I not been forced to be quiet and still. Um, so for me, I am very grateful for that because it wouldn't have happened otherwise. I almost forgot. I'm supposed to read a little bit from my book because part of the grant to make this happen <laughs> requires me to read. And that makes me think about stillness because one of the things I learned in, um, so funny how I just segued, right? But, um, <laughs> the, you know, but um, one of the things I learned during pandemic was that I was moving so fast. So when, you know, in some ways it was so hard to stop but I also started to take care of myself, right? In ways that I wasn't taking care of myself. And I bring up my character, Cara Romero. Um, Cara Romero in the book, yes, please. Um, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water is someone that does way too much. And I'm just gonna read like a minute long to fulfill the requirements <laughs> of this because I'm more interested in your questions. But um, this book is um, set in the Great Recession and here you go. Please write that down. Cara Romero wants to work. What is a person without an occupation? Since I could walk, mama taught me how to take papa's shirt, put it in a ball, and scrub the devil out of it with a bar of jabón de cuava. If we didn't work, they hit us. If we worked wrong, they hit us. If we tripped, they yelled. If we looked to them wrong, cocotazo. If we cried from the cocotazo, Another cocotazo. I don't look at me like that, like you feel sorry for me. All of that made me strong, you know. I had to be strong because what waited for me in this life? Oof. Let me tell you this. Compared to my parents, my husband Ricardo was good to me. In the beginning, we were happy. But even the moon and the honey go dark and rancid. And I tell you, if I stayed in Alto Mayor, I would be dead. Wait, one second. Permit me to drink some water. Yes, I'm okay. Maybe you've lived long enough to understand what I'm going to tell you. I will stop there with a cliffhanger. And I will also say, this book is available for pre-order. Pre-orders are really important. I'm not saying this because my book is available for pre-order, but because this is one way that you could support 
writers of color as well. Um, the problem is, like my family, they pre-order, and then they say, I pre-ordered the book, it's not, it didn't come. So I pre-ordered it again, and it didn't come. <laughs> the problem with pre-order is that you don't get the book until months and months and months from now. So it's like giving a present to the future self. <laughs> so if you want to give a present to yourself in three months, pre-order. <laughs> um, I also, <laughs> anyway, I'm just crazy, okay. <laughs> But I also want to say there's a raffle going on, and we have a few copies of the galley for those of you who can't wait and want to get a copy right now. Okay, so that's my bit for the grant. Okay, so. <laughs> I want to talk what? a little bit more about these pandemic gifts. Oh, let's talk about the I, pandemic gifts. We got, we got We're stuff back. to say. <laughs> <laughs> and you are my co-host, so let's go for it. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to say this because my situation, I think, is probably not that different from everyone else, but I also worked a full-time corporate job the entire time I was writing my book. And it really wasn't until the pandemic hit that I realized how incredibly unsustainable my life was um, because the children were at home. And I think like the ways in which I had lied to myself to say it's okay to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, it's okay to take every vacation to work, um, and I was very fortunate because by the time I decided to leave my job, I was married. I had been saving for a long time. I had been working a corporate job that paid really well. So when I decided to leave my job to pursue writing, I had already been working with an agent as well. And it's so interesting what you were saying before because I, you know, I quit my job a year and a half ago. And now that the book is out, a lot of my colleagues from my insurance job, you know, have gotten in touch with me. And they're like, wow, I can't believe you wrote a book and published it in one year. And I'm like, yeah, that's not what happened. That never happened. <laughs> I wish. Um, but, you know, I think one of the gifts for me was, like, really understanding, like, the importance of community. I mean, I remember being, you know, a virtual attendant in the first El Gran Combo and dreaming, just dreaming, you know, that, like, I one day would be in it. And look at me now. <laughs> I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But you know, I think that it's really, I mean, it's one of those things that I feel like we talk a lot of times about the systems that oppress us and like the systems that make it really difficult for our stories to exist. Because even when you're writing the best stories, it's like an uphill battle. And so much has changed within the, you know, I think at the heels of the murder, right? Of like, so, I mean, I can't even George Floyd and like Sandra Bland and like Breonna Taylor. I mean, like the, the brutality that prompted the changes that I think created an environment where my story was coveted. I think it's like such a painful reality of like how change comes about in this country. And like, so I feel like this like really humbling sense of like this obligation to constantly remind myself that like my my life creatively is because of like everyone that came ahead of me, but also that today in the publishing complex, I mean, the amount of diversity has never before existed. And if we don't keep like pressing and supporting each other and supporting our books, like it'll go away because it's cyclical the way things work. And so, you know, it's just really sobering. On the one hand, I feel like bursting with like joy and bliss that the book is out but then when I think about like what prompted me quitting my job and actually putting putting like the rest of the strength into making it happen and then the conditions that created um it I think it's heartbreaking too I, I just have to put in my yeah. two cents about how how our community can support artists because I think a lot of people don't realize that when you love a book and you say to your aunt, this is a great book, you should read it, and she reads it, and then you lend it to your cousin, and you lend it to your grandmother, and you, that's all wonderful. 17 people could read that book. <laughs> you know how much money the publisher made? They sold one book, right? So one thing I do is encourage people to gift books. Yeah. Um, because also it creates a, a, a tradition of reading, which is good. But the other thing is, get online and review books. Because publishers look at those reviews. How many reviews? If one book has 2,617 reviews and yours has 17, guess which book the publisher is going to think, we should do this again. 
not the one who's got 17, that's for sure. So that's another way. We can't do what we do without you. And I think it's a two-way street, right? Um, so that's my two cents. Um, I just want to make sure there's time for questions from the audience, unless you have something really like you really want to add. Or do you, is it okay? We could come back around. Yeah, Let's just see if there's any burning question from the audience. Is there, are there any burning, yes, okay. Uh, first of all, hello uh, everybody. My name is Nick, uh, Latino Survival Book Club. And first of all, thank you for it up and you know, having an awesome event, you know, with a rock star list, you know, <laughs> authors, you know, it's so important, you know, this representation, you know. Uh, and it was during the pandemic that our book club turned to Latino literature. Um, so my question is, hello, hello, hello. Um, my question is, Andrew, you, you started talking a little bit about like the pandemic and how difficult it was. And uh, a lot of your, listening to a lot of your stories, how it took five, 10 years, 15 years to write you know, your story. My question is, what was the inspiration or motivation that kept you going to tell this story you know, um, throughout all of these years or even during the pandemic? You know, or what kept you grounded to say, you know what, I need to write this, I need to tell the story, no matter if it takes five, 10, 15 years, what kept you pushing? Because the pandemic was hard, you know, and um, what kept you going through these times of difficulty? I guess is my question. Well, I think for me, the pandemic, and we're gonna, coming back to the gift that the pandemic gave us, it ties into your question, because for me, it gave me, um, it gave me more time to write. You know, before, before COVID, I used to travel a lot. I was writing speeches all the time because I was um, doing a lot of public speaking, giving a lot of speeches, and I wasn't really prioritizing my writing as much as I should have. And when COVID happened, all my events got canceled, all of them. So then I, I stayed home finally, and I had time to write. The other thing that happened was that the pandemic also helped me to unblock myself because I was struggling writing this book because the book is about an invasion. It's about a war. There's a lot of battle scenes. There's a lot of violence and, and, um, and carnage. And I didn't experience it, and I was really struggling like how to tap into that so that I could vividly bring these battle scenes to life and really portray what my characters were, were dealing with emotionally during this time of turmoil. And, that, and COVID gave me that because all of a sudden, and we were all experiencing this, a lot of anxiety, a lot of like stress and depression and worry about the future and uncertainty. And, and we were witnessing our world being upended. And I latched onto those emotions and I said, this is exactly how my characters are feeling. Like this, because their world is being upended. You know, this invasion has completely turned everybody's world upside down, and my characters are struggling to survive, and, and they're all dealing with all this anxiety and worry about the future. So I grabbed all of my emotions I was feeling, I channeled them into the book, and it kept me sane. I didn't realize how much this book was so good for my mental health, because instead of holding it in my body, I created a vessel to hold it all for me. And I emerged from, you know, I mean, we're still in dealing with it, but I have emerged from the worst of it um, pretty, pretty sane and, and, and pretty healthy, you know, body and soul. You know, Reina, this is why I wanted to read that tiny excerpt from the book because what I learned was kind of how I was always trying to be strong because that's, Mira, una matatana, that's what we say, in, you know, in, in Dominican, Dominicans will say, and you'll just work and work, and people are praising how hard we work. And it's exhausting. And writing a character who's embodying, constantly being of service, constantly working, and not dealing with trauma, not dealing with what's actually happening to your body, not dealing with our histories, is, you know, in the end, you pay the price in a different way, right? So I think that slowing down and, yeah, not traveling and moving all the time helped me sort of access things and then the book, and it was really useful for the work in that way. Do you want to add anything, Kat? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that kept me going is that this isn't about me. This is about my family and my people. I remember being a little girl, and my mother would take me to the cemetery outside of Denver, 
It's this big Catholic cemetery in the background. You can see the mountains all capped in white. Hello! <laughs> Hi, baby! Oh. Um, and I remember we would go and we would pray over all the different family members and we would drive to the different graves. And one of my uncles um, from the Philippines, my Uncle Jaime, he was a chauffeur for a very wealthy family in Denver in the 1920s and 30s. And he got into law school while he was a chauffeur. And you know, now thinking back, I'm like, this must have been the first Filipino ever accepted into the law school at the University of Denver. Um, he got tuberculosis and he died and he didn't get to go on to become a lawyer. And my mom said that it was our job to always remember Uncle Jaime. So we would always go and we would always pray and I never met him. And that's just how it always went. We were really poor people. We were really humble people. No one cared about us. We weren't in any books. We weren't in any history books. Nothing. And when I found out, you know, I was a little girl, I knew I had a gift. I knew I was a storyteller. And that's what this is about. It's not about me. This is about furthering my people, furthering our stories. Because I remember my Uncle Jaime, even though I never met him, his life is important. The fact that he drove rich people around and that he died early, that's important. He worked really hard. All of us have family members like that. So it's vital that we re retain those stories, we tell those stories, and maybe it's not through a novel, maybe it's not through short stories, maybe it's through songs and dance and food, but this is why I'm doing this and that's what kept me going, but this is my gift. Your gift might be something else. Um, but I, I had dreams about them while I was working on this book. They came to me, they visited me, and they let me know that you need to keep going. And they're heard all over the world now, like my work's been translated. Um, so that's, that's what kept me going. Yeah. Hi, I'm Soleda. Well, I just, on that note also, thank you all so much. Um, this is, it was beautiful to hear all of your books. Um, but I, just on that note about community, I wanted to know, was there actually any engagement with your community, with your families? I think sometimes when we think about the writing process, it seems very solitary, right? Like you're in a, a room by yourself for hours just typing away. Um, but how has your community shaped this? Was there any sort of interactions or like continuous, I don't know, like re reciprocal, you know, conversations that were happening about the books in terms of the process? Um, yeah. This is my favorite Angie Cruz story. And the reason that is my favorite story is because when I told Angie, she didn't remember. So let's start with the spoiler because it's actually very meaningful that she didn't remember. Um, you know, Angie and I met when I was in graduate school and Angie had, she went to NYU where I got my MFA and Angie graduated like a little bit ahead of me. And when Soledad, I mean, it's so like, perfect that your name is Soledad because when Soledad came out I just remember like falling over myself like I was like in love with Angie okay like I used to follow her around um, to all her events and like we struck a friendship and so when I left writing right because like I already told you all like I was very bruised from my book failing and I just felt like I it became a toxic place for me the publishing industry and I felt very inadequate around friends who were all making it and it's this is about me you know also because we have accountability about like when do we need to walk away from an environment that hurts us and for me like I knew I had to walk away and so what's so funny is that like from time to time, Angie, like one of two people in my life, okay, who still will hit me up and be like, hey, are you writing? Hey, I heard about this um, writing residency. Hey, there's this competition going on for a first novel. And I just remember like when I was going through like probably the most difficult time in my life where like my son was going through a really tough medical experience and like that was the turning point for me, deciding that I needed to get back into writing. That day I got an email from Angie, like, hey, I don't know what's going on. I haven't seen you around. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard anything about your writing, like, what's happening? And, oh, by the way, here's this thing you should apply for. And so fast forward, like, a couple years later, you know, I went to AWP and I saw her and she immediately invited me to lunch with a bunch of, like, fierce Latinas. And I was like, oh my God, Angie, remember that like email you sent me? Like was a turning point. And she was like, oh, I sent you an email. <laughs> and you know, like what, was like what was so important to me is that I realized like it wasn't about me. Like Angie is sending people emails. You know what I mean? Like Angie's the person in our community who like constantly checks up on all of us, who's extending opportunities. And it's not like, 
I thought it was because I was a chosen one and special. But like then I realized, no, all of us are chosen. All of us are special. And you know, and very often now I think Angie, because when I came back into writing, I was like, well, this time around I have to do it the way Angie has done it. Like I tried to craft community and to give as much as I'm taking because I think part of the reason why we haven't gone as far as we could collectively is because we buy into this mentality of like American exceptionalism and individualism, which doesn't work for us. There isn't enough of us to like do it on our own. And I will forever be thankful to that, to Angie for that. Oh my God, wait. First of all, I don't remember that, but I have to say that I was just here at Word Up a few days ago. Um, Lorja um, Garcia Pena wrote this book called Community as Rebellion, right? And she was speaking of this one thing, right? Like the reason I did that was because it was so lonely being at a book reading and being the only Latinx or black Latinx or whatever, like in these contexts. And I was like, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. And I don't write fast enough to produce enough books. Like, and people would meet me and I would be the first Latina they read. And then they would say, what else can I read? And they were dying to read other books, right? So in some ways, like seeking out other writers was like, we can't do this alone. It's very boring, first of all. Like, <laughs> like I like community and, <laughs> and I wanna be in conversation, but also it's bad for the work. Because the truth is that what we're doing, the more of us that get to publish and flex the breadth of expression I mean, we're such different writers. Right here, we're such different writers, the more possibility there is for literature in America, right? So in some ways, when we think about American literature, that's oftentimes taught as this very narrow way of thinking of what a story can do. It is so exciting to see these epic, multi-generational, huge cast of characters in one book. And it could only happen if more of us do it because we're learning from each other, right? We're inventing a whole new way of telling narrative to our experiences. So selfishly, I was like, I don't want to be alone. And it's so, I can't tell you how happy it makes me to be in this community, right? With some of you who are in the audience and like, you know, that are also writing. It's just like really, really important, I think, for the life of literature in the US because we are not the guests, you know? This is our space too. All right, um, uh, this is tough. Uh, my name is Nelson Roberto. I am one of the disappeared children of El Salvador. So I was, um, I was forcibly separated from my family as a kid. And I grew up in Boston and um, to an amazing family as an adopted child. And in 1997, I was reunited with my birth family, an amazing experience. So I grew up in high school and in college and after college, going down to Costa Rica and Panama and meeting my family and sort of rediscovering my, my roots, where I came from. Um, so I had two questions. Well, I had a, a comment and a question. Ooh. So to you, Reina, um, I recently read your uh, book, The Distance Between Us. And I was um, so surprised that like, even though our external circumstances were so different, I, I grew up in sort of upper middle class America, went to a private school, had a great education, but so many of the themes that you wrote about, like I connected with so deeply. Um, about that sort of, <sighs> Longing for family. And yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and, and, and just the struggles of having family spread out across Central America. And um, so I just wanted to thank you. Because I, I just recently found your, your memoir, I think like two, three months ago. So like I, I just read it and I was uh, um, very moved. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And then uh, my question to you and maybe to some of the other panelists is to say, so I have been working on my own memoir for the past six years and I just finished the manuscript draft a couple months ago. Um, <laughs> so 
as an aspiring author who, you know, maybe one day will be up on that stage, uh, what advice do you have to give to someone who's just starting out on their journey, sharing their story, um, sharing, you know, the, their life experience? Wow, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, it, it sounds so incredible and inspiring and just hearing you talk about the connection that we have made with each other through literature, through books, and it just makes me think about this is why we do what we do, you know, because we want to reach out, we want to uh, send that, that message that, that you're not alone, right? We're not alone, and even though like our experiences might might be somewhat different, uh, they're also universal experiences that that we that we all share, and it's so important for us to continue to celebrate those experiences, to continue to explore our history, our roots, our all of these um, journeys that we have undertaken to bring us to where we are today and who we are today. I think that is something we have to keep doing. So I'm really glad to hear that you're writing your own story. And um, I, I mean, I would say just write. You know, right now in the process where you're at, I would just not even think about putting on the writer's hat. Right now it's time to just write from the heart and let the good, the bad, and the ugly come out, especially the ugly needs to come out. Be because what you're doing right now is you are transforming your trauma into something beautiful, into a, into a work of art that you are then gonna be able to share with others. So give yourself that permission to just write from the heart. And then once you're ready, then you do need to put the writer's hat on and then you need to see what you have on the page and how you're going to shape it, how you're going to polish it, because it does take a long time to, to, to get to that place where the book needs to be. You know, and as uh, Angie said earlier, and, and Clavis said so too, that people think that a book just takes you know, a very short time and it, it magically appears in, your, your, in, in the bookstore and it takes a lot of effort to make it look effortless. So just prepare to put in the work. Remember that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And try to create a community around you. you know, make sure that you are constantly trying to meet other writers, exchange your work, try to get as much feedback as you can and, and yeah, and just, just keep plugging away one, one scene at a time. Yeah. And I also wanna say there is, um, I just had a conversation with an editor, I think it was at Flatiron, who was looking for El, like memoirs by someone from El Salvador, actually. So <laughs> I just, I can't remember the name of who it was, but what I'm saying is that there are editors looking for that particular story, so, once you do everything Reina said, like, make sure you get your work out yeah. there. Because I think there's a real strong interest right now for that particular story. And, it's an um, important one. My agent is in the room, so <laughs> make sure, Donna, raise your hand. Make sure you go introduce yourself. Yeah. Because that's another step. You know, Mira, you have to go talk to vez. agent. <laughs> yeah. My, my, you know, my editor sitting right behind yeah. you. Hint, hint. Yeah. So make sure you, you turn around and you introduce but, yourself. Mira, it's really a party now because I broke a glass. <laughs> there was music. Y estamos resolviendo de una vez. You know what I mean? Like, it's happening. By the way, there's a young person that wants to ask a question and we cannot ignore her. Hi. Um, I, just have, I just have, like, a really simple but co complicated qu question. Like, what really made you think and say, like, I want to become an author, or like I want to tell my story to like other people and see if they relate to me. Mm. Good question. question. Oh, she's asking, she says, I'm gonna ask a very simple or very complicated question, which is um, what made you think that you wanted to be an author and that someone's gonna relate to your story? Let's have one person answer that question because that way we could get the last few questions in. Yeah. Who wants to answer that question? Oh, no. Okay. I, 
No, no, no. You're on a roll. That was a really good answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, I feel like. Um, thank you for that question, because I think that's, that's a beautiful question, and it's very complicated. Um, you know, the first reason I became a writer is because I love books. So I loved reading books, and I also, just like Kali was saying before, like I found that there weren't enough like Afro-Dominicanos. It was always kind of suspicious to me in like the literature that existed about immigrant communities where like black people weren't in them. And so for me, like I felt like I wanted to put people who look like me explicitly on the page. And so it was that gap that I felt existed. There was an emptiness there. Um, but I also felt like, you know, when I read books about displacement and about communities where gentrification happens, it's like a given. And when I was in, you know, growing up in New York City, I feel like New York City and other places where I have visited, like London and Spain, and like even in the East when I have visited, like communities always fight back. And I felt like there was a big gap in the stories that were being told about, about gentrification, where like our communities seem really passive, and women in particularly were always presented as passive. So for me, I was like, I think I can do something that hasn't been done. And for most of us, I mean, I'm very fortunate because I actually got to read Angie's book ahead of time. I've read all their books. I can't wait to read the novel, Kali, because I love Sabrina and Corinne. It's like one of my favorite books. This book is unbelievable. It like blew me away, um, Reina's book. And I think what's happening time and time again is that each of us, you know, I think it's so interesting when you grow up in like MFAs and I studied literature in, in college when I was 18 and everybody tells you every story has been told. Every story has been told. But guess from what perspective that is? Like, our stories haven't been told. And I think that to me is so exciting. It's so beautiful that there are still all these stories we can tell that no one has told. And I think that's, like, our job to go do it. I think we could take one more question. Any? Yes, Kiani. Well, her question is, Angie Cruz and Kali, can... She's 10, but imagine that she's 15. Can she read your books? Because she wants to read your book, and she wants to read your, your book. Aww. Yes, for sure. Mia can. She can handle it. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love that. By the way, yeah. I mean, some people... Lucy. Did some people ask a question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kali. Luz is actually a teenager, so she's not that much older than you are. She's actually 17 years old. So, yeah, you definitely can read it. And there are some sections where she's only eight years old, and they're told from her perspective. So, yeah, you can read it. Awesome. By the way, I, um, I was part of the National Book Foundation. I started this. I was one of the founders of this club, um, uh, effort to get books to kids, right? It was called Book Up Middle Schoolers because it was a study that if you have books at home, even if the kids are not reading it, they actually will eventually read, even if it's much later in life. And in some ways, people think, they're not reading. I have this complaint all the time. They're not reading, but guess what? Neruda in the Park I was in my niece. I left it in her, for her mother, and she's like, oh, I started reading Neruda in the Park. I said, oh, that seems a little bit, I was like, I hope she doesn't get to the, you know, and then, <laughs> And then she's like, oh, I thought it was for me. And I said, that's how you get readers, right? Like you, sometimes we think because our kids are not reading and they're always on their devices, they're not reading. But having books at home, actually, eventually you're just like, okay, fine, I'll read a book. What else am I going to do? And you get caught, you know? So, yes. I, I just want to make one announcement. New York Public Library is doing a book giveaway for children and adults. Call them up. See what you can get. Um, I know in some of our families, we can't afford to spend $30 on a book, yeah. right? But if there's a giveaway, um, that's a very good thing. And so check it out. Yeah. Okay, do we have one last question before we close? One last question? Okay. Oh, you have a question too? Okay, okay, okay. I'm curious to know. I'm curious to know about the stories that you loved growing up that you either wanted to like 
write your own story because something may have been missing from that story or because you saw a part of yourself in that story? I'll take it. Um, I was really obsessed with the Little House on the Prairie books. I had the whole box collection. I read through all of them. My family lived in Colorado, so it seemed really similar, but it was all about these white settlers that came and they were really afraid of native people and my family, they were native and all of this stuff didn't make sense. So I thought it'd be really cool if someday I wrote like the Kali Fajardo Einstein version of Little House on the Prairie. Um, but yeah, so I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my books. Yeah, um, I just wrote an essay that was published uh, by LitHub where I talk about when I was a teenager, I would go in, into the public library and the librarian would give me Sweet Valley High and the Babysitter's Club and there were no undocumented Mexicans in those books and I often felt like, uh, even in literature, I started to feel like an outsider, you know, because books can be windows or mirrors but most of the time, children of color grow up looking through too many windows, and when that happens is you start to feel like an outsider, even in literature. So I began to feel that way, and I decided that I was gonna have to write myself back into literature so that I didn't feel visible and I didn't feel voiceless. Um. Because we're running out of time, we're just gonna find out what the last question is. What's that question, Carolina? Hi. Um, so to continue with the tradition of a gran combo, oh, yes. we always ask if there's a song that would go along with your books, since we love oh, that's music. that's true. Um, yeah, I just wanna know, like, what music were you listening to? What inspired you? If you had to, you know, make a playlist for your book, like, what songs would you choose? I actually wrote a song oh. for this book. Yeah, so it's, it's up on YouTube. Can you so sing it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I said I wrote it because I cannot sing. So, uh, yeah, so if you Google uh, YouTube, well, go to YouTube and then put in a ballad of love and glory, the song will, will come up and then you can hear it. But Ooh, it, I, I really love that song. I actually have a chapter that's named after a Bob Dylan song. So the chapter is called Shelter from the Storm. And with Sabrina and Karina, the ep epigraph is from Bob Dylan as well. So that's something I carry over with all of my books. Yeah. So for, for my book, you know, my, I wrote the book over a long time. And so all along, I know this is like a broken record. 15 years, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like one of the things I did is that I used to, I've always put music in it because it's about a community and there's always a car going by and there's like a, bitch, and you know, at one point I started changing the songs because I was like, oh, people are gonna know this is 10 <laughs> years ago, you know? And then like, actually during the very last revision, I went back and put the old music in. So if you're listening to it, you'll be able to tell like what are some of the songs. And I also have just a, a Spotify playlist with the, my favorite music. But one thing I would say too that I learned from the pandemic is that you know I have really young children and I can't listen to mute, bad, like curse words. So I would put my AirPods and I would listen to the nastiest, dirtiest music. <laughs> This music. And so it's really funny because sometimes I think like there's like a frenetic quality to the pace at a certain point. And I was like, it's because of that. Because all my music was like. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> well, what I, when I think of a playlist, I think in Spanish, there's certain things that don't translate. So one of my favorite songs is called Las Caras Lindas de Mi Gente Negra, which is the beautiful faces of my black people. Um, so I listen to that a lot. In English, um, well, there's Luther, but no, we won't go to those. <laughs> we won't go to those chapters. Um, but uh, when I want just like chill music, and often when you're writing violent scenes, you need chill music. Um, and so I listen to jazz. I listen to um, Miles Davis because that kind of just chills me right out. Um, I. In my new book, I, I'm not prepared for this question, and um, but I could think of Mercedes Sosa I listened to a little bit because I was thinking, I always kept thinking of that song, Gracias por la vida. 
And thinking really like so fortunate that I got to live near my family during pandemic. And so much of my book is about how the community takes care of each other. And I learned this from my mother who's here. I love to embarrass her because it's just so fun. But in some ways, like everything, the, my practice in the world really comes from my mother in the ways that she took care of so many people in our neighborhood and building. Um, and in thinking about gratitude, I wanted to say that, again, Word Up has done incredible work for all of us, for El Com Gran Combo, for writers. And if you at all want to support this store, you could become a member and get discounts on books and you could be a volunteer, but I encourage you to be a member because it's a way to make sure that the store doesn't feel stressed about always raising money. Um, all of this happens through grants, but that's a lot of labor to apply for grants when we actually could all pitch in, like collectively. So um, I encourage you to do that. Um, and then you also find out about events like this um, and get free tickets sometimes or et cetera. I don't even know what the benefits are, but there are many. <laughs> and, um, and it doesn't cost a lot. It's like five, 10, $20, um, whatever you can afford. So um, I think that we're gonna end our evening to sign books, um, unless there's something I forgot. Did I forget anything, Veronica? Oh. I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank you especially, all of you, for coming and making your way all the way up here. Um, I know sometimes it can be a trek, but we really do appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we're going to be signing. Um, definitely follow us for any upcoming events. We have um, a lot of cool events, including Ellen Hagen, who's here. She's going to have her book, uh, book launch here next month in July. Um, and yeah. What? Birthday. Oh yeah, we all <laughs> we're also celebrating our 11th birthday next yeah. month, our next week. Um, we're gonna be having a community gala just because we want to dress up fancy and not have to make everyone spend money. Um, and yeah, if you want to support this space, definitely talk to us, make donations, become sustaining members. Um, even just following us on Instagram and commenting like that really warms my heart whenever I see it. <laughs> Um, oh, Word Up Books. Just Word Up Books. You can follow us. Um, and yeah, so if you want to purchase any more additional books for the signing, make your way to the counter over there. We'll be moving some of the chairs around um, and getting ready for the signing. So just give us like five to ten minutes and then we'll get ready. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all of you. You're amazing.